start, the star of yesterday's lecture was the Brava fixed point theorem. It said that if you have a map from a ball to itself, yeah. remember that this is a closed ball, so it has a boundary, contains the boundary, and if the map is continuous, it must have a fixed point. And we deduced it from an easier, but ultimately more powerful fixed point theorem due to left shifts. Left shifts ap applies to only closed situations. In other words, when there is no boundary. Brava, of course, the problem involves a boundary. We have to resort to a trick. And we shall see many applications of this today. But before we start, let me make a comment about white and black. I have seen several times colleagues, mathematical colleagues, writing on a blackboard. Do this, do this, do this, and say black dot, white dot. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always wondered about this. Why? Huh? But, Why? but yes, but many people say this is black and this is white. <laughs> really, I wonder. a cup of coffee, not a cup of milk, because this is supposed to be black. <laughs> Puzzle. The surface of, of coffee, it doesn't have to be coffee, it can, it can be tea, as you know, consists of many, many, many molecules, tiny things. Together. For example, this is one, this is another, this is another, this is another, this is another, and so on. Lots of molecules. Well, start the coffee. Do you know what it means to stir? Remuer, so you put the spoon and then you do this. When you do this, maybe this molecule moves there, this molecule moves there, this molecule moves there, and this molecule might go there, and this molecule might go there, and so on. Molecules move around. But this motion is essentially continuous. What I mean is if you have two neighbor molecules, they go fairly close to each other. They don't separate like this when you start. At least let's assume that it's a continuous process and we are not introducing any discontinuity. And besides, I don't know how to introduce discontinuity. So start the coffee. And <coughs> the molecules, um, as I indicated here, move to some new positions, all the molecules. Theorem, which is a consequence of Brava, which is called twelve, is that there exists some molecule. which finds itself in its original position.
and maybe we should say what exists a molecule, it can be only one, uh, which okay, after being stirred. Okay, that's clear. That's because there must be, in this continuous mapping of the disk to itself, there must be a molecule which comes back to its original position. Because it's a continuous map from the disk to itself, before and after, there is a fixed point. That means that it comes back. Next example. I couldn't find the map of Musenberg, but you have probably seen a map of this region, Musenberg, Cape Town, and so on. Okay. Well, if you look at the map and put it on the floor, and let's say that you find Musenberg Mountain on the map, the top of the Musenberg Mountain. Have you been to the top of the Musenberg Mountain? Who has not yet been to the top of Musenberg Mountain? Maybe we should all go. Um, anyway, top of Musenberg Mountain on the map. Well, look at the point on the ground directly underneath the point on the map. Okay? So on the map it says top of Musenberg Mountain, peak of Musenberg Mountain. But the point directly underneath, the real point on the ground, is usually not the peak of the Musenberg Mountain, right? Do you see what I'm saying? It's too confused. If I take the map to the peak of Musenberg Mountain and put it there, of course the point underneath is the peak of Musenberg Mountain. So, usually the point on the map is not the same, it doesn't represent the point on the ground, the real point on the ground, which is directly under, underneath it on the map. However, Brava says the following. Drop the map of Musenberg anywhere in Musenberg. So what I do is to drop a map. Theorem. There exists a point on the map that represents exactly the point that it represents, represents the point on the ground. <coughs> directly underneath it. That sounds mi mysterious. But why is this? This is because this is the map of Musenberg and let's say, although it's very small, this is the actual Musenberg. Okay? Now, the actual Musenberg might be complicated shape, but that shape is homeomorphic to a disk. So, we have a mapping from a disk to inside itself. By Brava, there must be a fixed point. But fixed point means that there must be a point which did not move, which means that the point on the map is exactly above the point that it represents on the ground. <laughs> Interesting. More examples. Who in this class has learned or seen game theory? Anybody? Have you heard of game theory? You have. Game theory 
I would like to say, is a very easy subject. Well, okay, there are some parts that are difficult. I shall mention these in a moment. But overall, it's a very easy subject. You can learn it. If we have time, I can teach it in about one hour. <laughs> no, it's true. I teach game theory in one hour in Cambridge, and everyone understands everything. But, um, but it is quite useful. For example, economics. If you study economics in a mathematical way, and it's very fashionable, there are lots and lots of economists who study uh, mathematical aspects of economics. Game theory is one of the main tools of mathematical economics. And also in sort of policy making, um, plan sorry, sorry? Game. Yeah, and so on. Game theory is very popular. It's an easy thing. Now, there are difficult parts of game theory, not all of it is difficult, but that, uh, not all of it is easy, but the, the difficult part, it turns out, is encapsulated in something called the Nash Equilibrium Theorem. So when two people play, for example, Audrey and I play some game, naturally, Audrey wants to do her best and I want to do my best. And <clears throat> the situation where, you know, Audrey has some strategy and I have some strategy and we cannot do any better. In other words, if I change my strategy a little bit, then Audrey immediately has an advantage. And conversely, if she changes her strategy a little bit, bit, immediately that gives me an advantage. That situation is called the equilibrium in game theory. Is that okay? So if both players, Audrey and I, are very intelligent, we choose the equilibrium strategies. We don't choose anything else. Okay. Now, it's not clear that in any game with reasonable hypothesis, such an equilibrium exists. And it turns out that this equilibrium is probabilistic. But anyway, it's not clear that such an equilibrium exists. But the theorem, due to Nash, is that it does. So I should first state it and then explain a little more what's going on. The Brouwer fixed point theorem. was used by, in game theory, <coughs> to prove the existence of a Nash equilibrium. Nash N A S H. And this was done in possibly the shortest PhD thesis in history. Nash was a <coughs> graduate student at Princeton in the late 1940s. And he, in fact, primarily he was a geometer. He worked in geometry, and he left fantastic deep results in geometry. He's still alive, by the way. But one day, he was interested by von Neumann in game theory. So he thought about it, and he proved this absolutely fundamental theorem in game theory. And this is the difficult part of game theory, and for which he received the Nobel Prize in economics in 1994. Have you seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind? Yes. Nash is that man. Now, it turns out that the core of this proof is Brouwer fixed point theorem. Unfortunately, because we don't have much time in three weeks, I cannot devote an hour to teach you game theory and show you how Brouwer implies Nash equilibrium. But I'd like to encourage those of you who are interested in looking up, for example, Wikipedia and so forth, to teach yourself game theory and understand what Nash equilibrium is. And this follows from the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Another curious remark, although this is outside the course, Brouwer implies the existence of Nash equilibrium. It turns out, although it 
As far as I know, it's not mentioned anywhere in the literature that the converse is true. If you assume that any game, you have to put some hypothesis, but any reasonable game has a natural equilibrium, if you take that theorem, as a consequence, you can deduce Brouwer fixed point theorem, which turns out. So those two things are equivalent. Interesting situation. OK? If you're interested in the converse, I can explain it to you. But in order for you to understand the converse, you have to know what game theory is. OK. Now, I shall devote the rest of this lecture to a major application of Brouwer fixed point theorem. So those were small applications, entertaining though they were. Well, the game theory application is a major application because it became huge. You know, it's, we got Nobel Prize. And he received the Nobel Prize partly because he knew topology. That's very nice. Well, yes, because he, he was courageous enough to use a tool that nobody else was using. Yeah. So what people do is to keep using the tools that everyone else is using. Well, if you do that, you're competing with everyone else. And what are the chances that you win against the thousands and tens of thousands of other people? But if you do something different, you have a much better chance. OK. So application, this is going to be applied to probability. To be precise, to what is called finite Markov chains. Please raise your hands. Who has heard of Markov chain? Who has never heard of Markov chain? And uh, have you heard of Markov chain or have you not heard of Markov chain? Then you should say one or the other. You should have raised your hand when you when I ask who has not heard of Markov chain. So, find the Markov chain. I shall explain what Markov chain is. I hope you understand what it is, but if you don't, don't worry. You can fall asleep until the end of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Markov chain is the most important of random or stochastic processes. When you learn probability, you first begin by learning, oh, what's the probability that, for example, when you t toss a coin, heads appears? Of course, it's one half. OK. Everyone knows that. You don't have to learn probability to do this. And then you do more and more complicated things. You learn various theorems, such as low large numbers, um, central limit theorem, and so on. But what is really interesting in probability goes, happens be beyond this. In other words, random processes and stochastic processes. When nature or some phenomenon evolves in a probabilistic way, not deterministic, with lots and lots of uncertainties, how does that evolution work probabilistically? That's stochastic processes. And Markov chains are the best kind of um, stochastic process. That's the kind that everyone has studied, and it's best understood, and it appears most often in applications, so Markov chain. Roughly speaking, it says the following. Let's say that some system, phenomenon, can be in many different states. You might be reminded of, if you are taking statistical mechanics, what you're talking about in StatMec. There's no, that's not an accident, because this is sort of a statistical mechanics in some sense a special case of the discussion. So you have many, many different possible states in which your system can find itself. And as usual, for a geometry topologist, we shall draw a picture. And this is a collection of all the different states. Interesting idea. So for example, if you have some block of material, yeah, so you can say, oh, in this state, the temperature is 45 degrees, and the pressure is 25 Pascal. And in this state, the temperature is minus 15 degrees, and the pressure is 0 Pascal. In this state, the temperature is 200 degrees, and the pressure is 480 Pascal, and so on. You know what I mean? Different states. So it's an abstract picture, but it's a picture nonetheless. And suppose that we have some evolution of this state. The state evolves in time. It starts changing in time. And 
say that it can go from this state to this state. But it's not a deterministic process. So it can also go from here to here, or it can jump from here to here. OK? And so how do we decide which way to go? Well, let's say that I change from this state to this state with the probability 1 half. This state to this state with probability 1 sixth, and this state to this state with probability 1 third. Okay? The total is 1, if I'm not mistaken. So that determines, or that, that describes the probabilistic evolution. Okay? So it changes from this state to this state more often than from this state to this state, and so on. And then you can draw these arrows all over the place. So it can go this way, it can go this way. Maybe this is also communicating. And, and so on, OK? And then you might have something like this. You might have something like this. You know, who knows what's going on? Oops, sorry. This way and this way. You understand the idea? So all of these have probabilities. And also, you might actually have a probability for staying at the same state. Okay? That's indicated by an arrow that goes like this. And so, in fact, in many of those states, in this case, for example, at this point, the probability of staying in the same state is zero. Yeah? But you might have lots of other states where you stay at the same state and so on. Okay? Is that clear? So here, I might try to put this there and so on. So that's a Markov chain. What we do is you assume that you are in some state, and then you say, bang, and then you, know, you have the probability of being in this state, in this state, in this state, in this at the next step. And then you say, bang, and then they all jump. And now you have a new probability distribution of being in which state, and so on. Okay? Another way of thinking about the same thing is the following. Suppose that you have lots and lots of, what, what can you think of a? Can you think of a very small animal? Huh? A rabbit. A rabbit. OK. Oh. One day likes rabbits. OK. Let's think of millions of rabbits. And let's say that I put those rabbits in different states. And suppose that I put, say, a lot of rabbits here, fewer rabbits here, quite a lot of rabbits here, fewer rabbits here, an enormous number of rabbits there, and so on, OK, in each of those states. So the distribution of rabbits tells you the distribution of the probabilities of being in the various states. All right? And then you say, bang, and you ask all the rabbits in this state, yeah? so maybe there are 2,000 rabbits here, to jump over here with probability one, one half, over here with probability one third, jump here with probability one sixth. Or simply say, half of the rabbits ask to go here, one third here, one sixth here, and so on. OK? And from all the states, all the rabbits are obedient, because rabbits are obedient animals. When you say, pang, you, they all jump. That gives you a different distribution of rabbits in different states. OK? So that's the distribution of rabbits after one step. And then you do it again. They all jump after two steps, and so forth. Is that clear? OK. So that's a Markov chain. And it turns out that this model, simple though it is, is extremely uh, applicable. And this kind of picture that depicts all the states is called a state space, space of states, if you like. And let's say that you want to label the states. So I'm going to label the states by some number, 1, 2, and so on, up to m. Different states. Thus, in state number 1, you might have a temperature of you know, 40 degrees and a pressure of 23 pascal, and so on, in different, different parameters for the different states. And let's denote by p sub i of t the probability of um, being in state number label i at time t. And t, I shall assume, is discrete. That's what I meant by pam, pam, 
bang, bang. I blow a trumpet, and then all of these rabbits, boom, jump at the same time. Okay. So t is discrete, time is discrete. Well, how do we describe those jumps mathematically? There is a very elegant way of doing it. Let us call G a certain matrix. We shall call it the generator, or if you read the, the probability literature, often it's called transition matrix. This matrix is going to be M by M, and the entry of this matrix, Gij, Ij entry of this matrix, is simply defined to be the probability of jumping from state J to state I. Is that okay? For example, you might have only two states. This is state one, this is state two, and let's say that state one to state one is one third and two thirds, and in here, you jump with probability one, and you stay with probability zero. Okay, so this is a Markov chain. And so what you see is the following. This is ij, that's one, one. So how, with what probability do I stay, jump from one to one? It's one, one three, one third. With what probability do I jump from, sorry, so if from j to i. So here, it's the entry two, one. So with what probability do I, do I jump from two to one with one? Here, it's um, one, sorry, two, one. So from what probability, with what probability do I jump from one to two here? This is two thirds and this is zero. Okay, that's how you write it now. Okay? Now, if you do that, it's clear that the following takes place. What is P1, P2, and so on, Pm of 1? How do I calculate that? Let's regard it as a vector. Well, it's simply equal to, it turns out, G, this matrix applied to P1 at 0, Pm at 0. Because the probability of being at P1 at time 1 is simply equal to the weighted sum of various probabilities at the previous step, together with the weights corresponding to with what probability you are jumping into state 1. OK? Is that clear? So that's what it is. And you can imagine what's going to happen. P1 at time 2, please remember that <coughs> this variable is the time and the index is the label of the state is equal to g and applied to p1 at time 1 to pm at time 1 but we know what this uh, vector at time 1 is it is this so it is equal to g squared i calculate the matrix squared bless you at and applied to the probability distribution vector at time 0 and so, you understand already that in general, Pm at time t, excuse me, P1 at time t to Pm at time t is equal to, what is it? G to the t power, of course, and applied to the initial distribution. We shall call this vector the initial distribution for obvious reasons. This tr is shorthand for distribution. Okay? Thus, the analysis of the Markov chain, all the information about Markov chain, is contained in this matrix, generator matrix, transition matrix G. And the entire mathematics of Markov chain is about analyzing multiples, the products of G. How do you calculate the products of matrices? The best way to do it is in an eigenbasis. 
after diagonalizing the matrix. And then the products are very easy to calculate. So that's how you proceed in the Markov chain.